I'm Jeannie. I'm Rachel. And I'm Nikki from Tyrion's Landing. A podcast member of the Gunna Geek Network. Just like the one you're listening to now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out all the other podcasts at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. And get ready because geekiness begins in... Three, two, one... Thank you for pressing play and welcome to episode 156 of Better Podcasting. On this show, we discuss talking to somebody in person. In person? In this week's Better Podcasting download, we have an update on spamming and talk about another supposed industry distributor coming into the podcast space. I have no idea who these people are. And finally, in this week's Better Podback, we run down all your great feedback, including your Mount Rushmore podcasting picks. Lauren, it's a good thing you're here in person tonight. Start the show. Welcome to Better Podcasting, a show where we talk about podcast tips, tools, and best practices to help you succeed with your podcast. What makes us different? Well, just like you, we podcast purely out of the love and fun of it. Podcasting is our hobby, and we recognize that it's yours too. We always encourage your questions and feedback, and you can find all of our contact information at betterpodcasting.com. Here's your host for the show, Stephen John Drew and Stargate Pioneer. Welcome to episode 156 of Better Podcasting. I am Stephen John Drew and joining me, of course, is the non six Stargate Pioneer. Just cursed you there. Oh, dang you, Stephen. Now I'm going to get sick right before my vacation. Hey, hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Better Podcasting. I'm actually sporting a podcast t-shirt given to me by a listener, the House of EdTech Podcast. Thank you very much, Chris Nessie, for sending that my way. Very much appreciated. I just got it today, just threw it on specifically for this podcast. I might actually get too cold and get sick because of it, but I am wearing the shirt and I will wear your shirt too. So you can send it on in whenever you want to. You're going to wear my shirt. That's really weird. Really odd. The only way I would wear your shirt is I am going to throw it through the wash several times first and make sure it's steam clean. Uh, that's probably a safe bet. I'm going to go ahead and just say that right now. I agree with your decision on that. And I'm going to wear gloves before handling it myself. Anyway, we have a jam pack show. There is a ton of great stuff to go through. So we just better get down into it and start right now. We start every show off with a how I saved my podcast story, which is either one of us or more importantly, one of our listeners sharing with the class how they saved your podcast. Everybody who's been a podcaster for more than a month has had to do something to save their podcast. Don't worry. You're not going to be shamed here. You're not going to be pod shamed. We're going to share with the class so that everybody can learn. So hopefully we all won't do the same mistake. And that is a how I save my podcast story. And in the weeks, we don't have one from everybody else. We create a how I could have saved my podcast story by reading something from the internet. But this week we do have a how I saved my podcast story. It's from listener Damien with adventures in Aurelia. Do you want to say it with me now, Stephen? Are you ready? Aurelia. Pod. Yeah, pod. 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 Mm. pod. Well, pod. That was pod. the worst pod. one we've ever done. Let's, it, just play. Let's just play the clip. Let's just do that. Hello, Stephen and SP. This is Damien the DM from the Adventures in Aurelia podcast. And I have an interesting little thing to bring up for you guys today. Uh, I had mentioned that my group was going to be trying a live stream for the first time a couple weeks ago and we did and this is a little bit of a kind of how I save my podcast as well as a somewhat unexplainable event that had happened so I've got a little bit of audio here that I'm gonna play for you guys and to explain my setup we uh, we record with a zoom h6 all five of us and For live streaming, I knew that I wanted to have the Zoom H6 going into my computer as a USB interface and then using the Zoom H6 interface as the audio stream in OBS for the live stream so that the audience was going to be getting all of our nice quality straight from the Zoom. And I ran into something very interesting that unfortunately wasn't caught until much, much 
later than I wish it had been caught. And it had to do with one of the channels, for some reason, not outputting to OBS at the proper volume. It was almost as if like it was getting no gain on the microphones that we were using. So here's the audio that ended up going out on our live stream. And since we monitored straight from the Zoom H6, we did not hear this. So I'm going to play this little bit in Vegas here. Oh, no. So it has been a very, very long time. I think we're looking at about nine months or so since we have visited this campaign and these characters. Let's go around the room and kind of describe your character a little bit. Start with Chris. All right. So that there is the example that I gave for how I sounded. That was mm -hmm. like to, to give a baseline. And then this was the channel that did not sound right at all. Chris. So yeah, I, I hope that you could even hear that at all, but there is that that clear difference. And the way that I consider this a bit of a how I saved my podcast is, at least from the start, I never planned on using the audio from the video itself. Instead, I had made the decision from the start to use Hindenburg and record through there. So I'm going to go ahead and move over to the Hindenburg. This is the same exact section as it was recorded through Hindenburg and as we were hearing it while we played and that's why we had never noticed it. Do you have the correct So it has been a very, very long time. I think we're looking at about nine months or so since we have visited this campaign and these characters. Let's go around the room and kind of Describe your character a little bit. Start with Chris. Uh, Sug is a... Hmm. He's a half-orc. Young for, I guess, normal people. But as far as half-orcs go, he's like right on the verge of being like 20-ish. But he's only like 18, 17, 18. Uh, he was a slave for several years. Basically, most of his childhood and formative years. Uh, recently escaped... I guess. So there we go. Um, I, I really don't understand why that happened. They were both Hindenburg and OBS for the stream were being captured as the USB interface from the H6. So I don't know what happened. All I know is I'm glad that I had made sure to dial in Hindenburg better and that it came out good. So I guess that was kind of how I saved my my uh, podcast as well as an unexplainable bit of an issue that i had uh thank you guys for everything that you do at better podcasting and i'll talk to you guys in the future as a special little note there damien told us that this was actually live streamed in support of extra life's game day which raised money for seattle's children's hospital so congratulations for using your podcast for good and charity sake damien Absolutely. And yeah, this sort of thing does happen from time to time. It's great to see that you had it recovered. Um, my personal speculation theory on it is that somehow uh, it was only pulling one of the channels um, or perhaps a, a left right sort of situation, uh, because I know like with certain streaming software, they don't pull the full array of all the different multi tracks that can possibly come in. And so perhaps Hindenburg was pulling all of the tracks individually, and so the one that was going out to Twitch was only one of the specific channels, and, you know, what you were hearing quiet was sound bleed. That's my my random speculation. I do know I've, I've heard people have problems with, with uh, just only certain channels being picked up by Twitch or by their streaming software, so that's a random theory. If you are somebody who's had this problem, check to see if maybe that's the case and the software is not pulling all of the channels, but... It's great that you had that backup. And again, 
Backup recordings. How many times can we say it on this show? So important. It is so important to have a backup recording because it will go wrong. It's not a matter of if it will. It is when it will. I want to say thank you very much, Damien, for sharing this with us. That was incredibly kind of him and we definitely appreciate him showing the troubles that he's been having second of all i was under the assumption and i've never done it myself that you could not use the zoom h6 record and as an interface at the same time damien said oh no 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 you can you can do both so my hat is off to him for teaching me something about my two zoom h6s that i've never quite used that way backup recording Two different softwares, that was awesome. In addition to the H6, that was awesome as well. What I did notice from the waveforms, and if you haven't watched the video, you can go over to the video portion at getageek.com. Betterpodcasting.com slash 156 will take you right there. And you will see the actual video of the waveforms that he was talking about. What I noticed in the waveforms in Hindenburg was that there was an awful lot of crosstalk between the microphones, as you would kind of expect in a situation like that. But that leads me to believe that it was picking up one of the crosstalks from one of the other microphones instead of his microphone the, in the channel two, as he was saying. And that could be a possibility of a mislabeled track or audio drivers being screwed around with, which happens all the time with Windows 10 and OBS. So you got to go into OBS every time and make sure that all the audio drivers are okay. So I suspect something like that happened. And he said it kind of fixed itself for the next time. So there's no way to actually test it. But if anybody has an idea beyond what we've described of what exactly happened, I'm sure Damien would be glad to know, but it's always good to be able to monitor from where you are recording and get that actual audio information. Thank you very much, Damien, for sharing that with us and with everybody on Better Podcasting. Absolutely. Again, that's betterpodcasting.com slash 156. And if you have a How I Save My Podcast story, please send it in to us through any of the ways. You can go ahead and you can tweet us at betterpod, facebook.com slash betterpodcasting, or email podcast at betterpodcasting.com. And because we are a full video show, that's right. If you didn't know that, we do have a full video show uh, product, and that's at betterpodcasting.com. Please send us a video, because that was great having that for this How I Save My Podcast story. But let's go ahead and talk about being in person with your podcast. What? I don't know in person. So weird. All right. Before we get into our featured segment here, I just want to get a little sneaky because I know I've looked at our Apple stats. I know sometimes people skip over the, the beginning. I know that. I know it's the case. I, I don't know why. I think that it was very rude to a really pod. Very, very rude. But you know what? I understand that happens. So in the featured segment here, before I start, I want to mention that we are looking for you to send us a goal for your podcast for 2019. So what we want you to do is listen back to your podcast. Think of it from the listener perspective. What can you improve in your podcast and set one goal for 2019 and send that to us to podcast at betterpodcasting.com. Just pick one goal based off of listening back to your show and send that in to us before December 9th because we want to do an episode that talks all about this. So again, that's podcast at betterpodcasting.com. And maybe if you find yourself in person with somebody, you can talk about each other's 2019 goals. So let's talk about being in person with people. SP, what do we got going on today? You know, Stephen, podcasting by nature is such an, I want to say impersonal, but it's not. It's very personal, but it's not in person. It's an electronic thing. Heck, many podcasters even find themselves podcasting on a routine basis with co-hosts whom are thousands of miles away from them or whom they've never met in real life. Steven, we don't know anybody like that, do we? I, I don't know. I, I have no idea. Okay, I know what you're saying. What you're trying to say is that you and I have never met in person. But what you don't know is you've never seen me in person. I've seen you in person lots. 
The only reason I know you physically exist is I've actually met your brother in person once. (laughs) So I I can extrapolate that. Therefore, you exist if he says you exist. So anyway, it's safe to say that many podcasters are really comfortable dealing with people on the Internet. But the question is, how do you handle your love of podcasting in person? So that's what we're going to talk about today, how to promote your podcast in person. We'll break down some of the good practices, the bad practices and things you should be prepared for to make an engaging promotional statement with somebody else. Let's start off, Stephen, with what you shouldn't do. This is the fun part. Let's be real here. These are all the bad habits and things that we want to discourage you from doing. And let's start with the obvious one. The obvious thing when you're trying to promote your podcast in person is to avoid talking about it nonstop. Let's be honest. Let's relate this away from podcasting for a minute here. We've all been in the situation where you've had a coworker or a really good friend, and all they do is nonstop talk about their kids. They find a way to relate every story that's going on about their kids. They'll tell you what their kids are up to. They'll show you endless amount of, of photos, and it's just nonstop kid talk. Now, replace kids with podcasts. You don't want to be that person that is going on and on and on about your podcast. The odds are, if you find yourself nonstop talking about your podcast in person with, you know, friends or coworkers and whatnot, while you might be excited, they might not be so excited and you might just be doing yourself a disservice. So ease those reins a little bit there because you don't want to be that person that is talking about their kids and their kids is the podcast. The next thing you don't want to do is assume that everyone wants your podcasting merch. Now, while it might be great for listeners, the reality is that not everybody is going to appreciate that custom shirt or custom mug with your logo on it. I mean, how many times have you gotten a tote bag from somewhere only to stuff it in with your other 30 tote bags or throw it away even? Or how about those endless coffee mugs that banks seem to give away? Yeah, that's a hashtag 90s reference, even though I'm holding one in my hand right now. (laughs) seriously you might think it's so cool to see your stuff on other stuff and we agree with you it is totally cool but it's only cool if somebody appreciates it otherwise it's going in the same place as that free i can't believe steven's making me say this free blockbuster t-shirt again the 90s reference right you know how many people had those free giveaway blockbuster shirts lots of them and nobody cared about that another common mistake that people make when they're trying to promote their podcast in person is assuming that traditional marketing is going to work. Think about what is involved with the process of a podcast. You need to educate someone on your podcast. You need to tell them how to get your podcast. And you might even need to tell them what a podcast is. If you see a poster up on the street and it says, quote, see band Colin Drew perform December 1st at Madison Square Garden, that's really easy. You know that that is a band, band Colin Drew, and you know exactly what it's about. You're going to see them December 1st at Madison Square Garden. Straightforward. But if you put up a poster about your podcast, think about all of the things I just mentioned, and you got to shove all of that into a poster. Yeah, okay, is that really going to fly if you have... Oh, Apple Podcasts and Spotify and blah, 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 blah. It's a lot of text. So maybe a traditional marketing idea like a poster might not be the best idea for a podcast. It's also not good for your podcast art either. But here are some do's that you should endeavor to incorporate when you talk to somebody else about your podcast. Let's start about being prepared for the right avenue to talk about your show. Now, consider. How would you describe your show quickly and entice somebody to spend their time listening to your podcast? Now, this technique is often known as an elevator pitch. It is short, concise, and it's a way to describe your project to anyone in the time it takes to ride the elevator to the next stop. Now, here are some keys for a good elevator pitch. First of all, simplicity is definitely the key to the whole thing. Now, if the person you are speaking to is interested, they will ask for more. If they are not interested, you don't waste either of your times, plus maybe break a relationship. So if you cut it short, you're going to salvage that relationship. See, it's a work relationship or a friend relationship. You just don't want to be that guy that won't shut up about your podcast. So simplicity, just get to the point in and out, and that's it. 
The second key to a good elevator pitch is naming your show. You want to be clear and you want to say your show's name. Now, don't mumble through the pitch by saying, uh, you know, it's just some internet show I do. Uh, no, be clear. Say you have a podcast and it is called, we'll just, for example, say your hobby podcast, followed by a qualifier like, hey, it's a show that discusses all things dealing with this great hobby. So, hey, I have a hobby podcast. It's called your hobby podcast, and it's a show that discusses all things dealing with this hobby. That is naming your show and being clear about it. The next key to a good elevator pitch is to identify the problem you are solving and how your solution will benefit the person you are talking to as a listener. Now, in the case of a podcast, it is a place to discuss your topic and no one else is discussing it or can discuss it like you. I'm going to give you a couple examples here, Stephen. For example, quote, I co-host Better Podcasting, a podcast for the hobby podcaster. You know, while there are several other podcasts about podcasting, we focus on the hobbyist or passion podcaster that either cannot or won't monetize their show, unquote. That's the statement there. You have now described what the problem is. It is a podcast that helps other hobby podcasters that might not be able to get help other places. Or, Stephen, this is another example that may be better for you in your show. Quote, I produced Voices of Defiance, the only podcast left about the fun sci-fi show Defiance that was paired with a video game, unquote. Hey, I'm saying this is the only place that you can actually hear Defiance discussed on a podcast on the internet anymore. Now, while there might be one episode or two episodes, this is going to be the only show. So those are some examples of identifying the problem and how it can benefit the listener. The next key thing to talk about in the elevator pitch is to make sure that you adapt your pitch to the audience when possible. Now, if you know the person you are talking to, or perhaps the crowd you are talking to has a specific interest that would relate to your show, use it. For example, quote, Hey Frank, I hear you talking all the time, sitting in a chair with a beverage and wanting to watch paint dry. I happen to produce the better paint drying podcast to enhance the process and experience of watching paint dry. I'd really think you'd enjoy it, unquote. So that's one example. Or even, this is another example, quote, Hey Sam, you've been asking a lot of questions about taking your drone flying to the next level. Did you know I co-host the Better Drone Flying Podcast? Every week we discuss a different tip on how to maximize your drone flying fun and what product upgrades to keep your eyes on, unquote. Those are two great examples there to identify the individual you need and make sure you're adapting your pitch to the individual. And the final key that I'll talk about with making a good elevator pitch is the closing takeaway with continuation option. Yes, we just talked about insurance options there. No, we didn't. But you've reached the next floor and the elevator's slowing. The doors are starting to open and it's time to wrap up your short pitch. You can be prepared with a website like yourhobbypodcast.com and a business card but you either need to decide if it's time to close the sale or offer to continue the conversation. And this is going to be a game time decision. Now, this means for those of you that don't get that vernacular, that you are going to have to play this part by ear. Now, if the other party you are talking to or group that you are talking to has a second, ask them to pull out their phone and try to subscribe to your show if they have shown any sort of demonstrated interest in your short talk. If it's an Apple podcast or if it's an iPhone, an Apple podcast app would be good. Or if it's an Android, go ahead and use that Google podcast search. And those would be the two go to's to use with the specific phones that are out there right now. Here's another option is to offer to continue to talk about it. If you know that you will be seeing this person again, offer to talk about it later, you know, getting a cup of coffee, going for a walk or something like that, or offer to talk about it more over chat or email, however you're connecting with them. But if there has been no demonstrable interest, go back to what we said before in the don't section. Don't push it. You might have just planted a seed and you don't know it. But if you continue to stomp on that seed, the seed will be crushed and will never germinate. Or worse yet, that paint will never dry. Wow. Did you just say the, the paint drying podcast? Did you work that into your whole little bit there? That's my shtick. 
It is. And yes, I did work that in there. So now with that elevator pitch locked down, Stephen, how are you going to help the person you're talking to remember what it is? Well, first, hopefully you've listened to our advice and you're going to have a catchy name for your show that is easy to remember and easy for people to think about. So, for example, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., if you were doing that elevator pitch when you were in the middle of a conversation about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., that's an easy jump. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., right? So close. Or if it's about podcasting, better podcasting. So simple, right? So hopefully you've got a name like that. But if you're wanting to sort of enhance that recollection and help them remember a little bit better, one thing you can do is show them the cover art on your phone. And this can be helpful for a couple of reasons. Number one, you're going to show them how professional you look. Hopefully your cover art makes you look good. But secondly, when they are searching in whatever way they're going to be searching later, hopefully when they see your show, they'll actually make that recollection and go, oh yeah, there you go. That's the art that I saw a little bit earlier by Uncle SP. Of course, you could also relate it to something else that they love doing or maybe even have a problem with so that they have that mental connection, something that's passionate to them. As well, give them an easy way to find specifically what you might be talking about. So if you pulled up something out of your memory banks that is on a specific episode, you can make that easy for them to remember. So if it was like, okay, yeah, check out the first episode of Better Podcasting at betterpodcasting.com slash one. That's a lot easier than going to go to betterpodcasting.com, scroll down, the very bottom, you're going to see a next button. Press the next button about eight or nine times. It might be 12 or 13 until you get to the very end, then find one. So it's a lot easier to say betterpodcasting.com slash one. So the easiest way that you can make it accessible for them. But what happens if you're in a situation where you might have to even explain what a podcast is? How do you handle that Stargate pioneer? I would just go all Leo Laporte and I would tell them it's a netcast and they'll just automatically understand. Right, Stephen? No, hold on. You did that wrong. Uh, you're going to go all Leo Laporte and tell them that it's a uh, this episode was sponsored by <laughs> uh, for in the next couple of minutes. Yeah, <laughs> the next couple of minutes. Yeah, right. OK, that's an inside podcasting joke. Uh, Leo Laporte will prefers to call podcast netcasts and nobody actually believes what he is. So when that fails, be prepared to describe what a podcast is in a relatable fashion. For example, it's kind of like downloadable talk radio or Hey, it's kind of like Netflix for audio programs, something like that, whatever they're going to actually relate to. But one of the best ways you can handle this, let's say it again, Stephen, just go ahead and show them either with your phone or their phone and just show them it's free and that they can get it. Free is a big thing. Make sure you say free mm -hmm. a lot. I think Apple is a huge missed opportunity for people who are using iPhones because like, let's be real, the Google podcast player, there are a lot of potential problems with that for somebody new to podcasts. They might not realize that it's streaming audio. That's all. There's a big flag. But Apple podcast is so refined. You know that it's there. It's, it's easy to get to. So if that person you're talking to has an iPhone, how cool would it be for you to pull up their phone and say, hey, can I see your phone and go in and show them something that they had sitting there the whole time? So how awesome would that be? It would be. Now, if they are actually genuinely interested after you're doing your brief show and tell, and again, please remember the baby situation. Everybody's baby is the cutest in the world to them. And it's not always the case to everybody else. So if you're sure that they are actually interested, go ahead and show them how easy it is to subscribe and listen to podcasts. And don't just show them your podcast. You know, at this point, you're educating somebody on what a podcast is. And if they think it's only to get to your show, they aren't going to spend a lot of time to figure it out. But if you show them the plethora of other different podcasts available, remember, there's like 550,000 shows available on Amazon. 110,000 are recent within the last 90 days. That's actually going to be enticing to somebody. Again, at this point, you're selling the industry and not necessarily just your show. So ask them what they're interested in, do a search, show them how easy it is to look for a podcast that they might be interested in besides yours. And while you're showing them, make sure to let them know that they are free. I'm going to say that for the second time. Podcasts are free. That's a big selling point to a lot of people. 
I remember Emily Prokop telling about the time that she moved. She got to a new place. She had internet and nothing else. And she didn't really have a lot of money to spend because, well, she just moved. And she went to her phone. She found the free podcast app and was like, oh, what's this? And started dialing into podcasts. And that's how she started because it was free. So, yes, free is a big indicator for a lot of people. Now, the bandwidth might not be free if you're not on Internet, but the actual podcast themselves sound like a song where you're spending one ninety nine or two ninety nine on the individual song. So how do you know, Stephen, if the person or people you are talking to are genuinely interested? Well, for me, uh, I always assume that they always are interested in me because I'm always interested in me. Right. You're too sexy for America, that's for sure. <laughs> no, what you want to do is pay attention to their responses and their body language. If they're giving you very short responses, the odds are they probably don't care. I know, we're using this baby anal uh, analogy quite a bit here. So, for example, hey, look at my baby. Oh, she's very cute. That is very different than, oh, look at my baby. And the response being, oh, look how she's got her foot in her mouth. Do you have any more pictures? That's actually somebody who's genuinely engaged because they've commented on the baby, they've expressed genuine interest in it, and they've asked to see more. Very different responses, and uh, odds are the first person just wants you to stop showing your baby pictures. Again, your podcast. Yeah, and if they're looking like they're just checked out, you know that glazed off in the distance look, or maybe they're looking around and not maybe directly at you. They probably don't care. Don't be that person that drags the other person into that conversation further and further when the other person did, might need to go to the bathroom or something like that. But perhaps they start a conversation with you about what podcast they actually like. Now you know that they actually do care about podcasts and you can go ahead and talk to them maybe a little bit more about yours if they're interested in your subject matter and your content. And lastly, Stephen, one of the best pieces of advice that we have to give our listener, you, I'm talking to you, our listener right now, in this regard, in the do's is to make sure that you have a way to open up the conversation in a natural manner. For example, people might not care about your podcast merch, but if you are embracing your podcast merch, it might get people to ask about it. For example, if you're wearing a podcast shirt, if you're using your podcast mug, etc. As long as you're comfortable with it, feel free to wear it and use it. It's a great way to open up the conversation and naturally People find other people who are actually interested when you're doing this. Like if you're in the mall and you see somebody maybe with a Star Wars shirt and maybe it's one that you like. Hey, Star Wars, you like Star Wars, that sort of stuff. And then if you have a podcast shirt on, they're like, oh, wow, you're a podcaster. And then you can get that conversation going. So on the same train of thought, you should be prepared for that random person who is totally bought into everything that you're saying. For example, having that business card on hand, like in your wallet or in your purse, and it's just ready to give them if they actually want it or ask for it. There has been a few times in my life where I have not had a business card with me and I've actually taken out like a dollar bill or something and put the information on it because they really want it. And if you have an email stationary ready with all your information that you can send them an email, but again, Make sure it's appropriate for the situation. I mean, given the person who just told you about your show, a bumper sticker might come off a little bit desperate. Like if you have those bumper stickers, just print it off and in your man satchel, Stephen, like I know you do. Yeah. Don't be giving those out to everybody. Don't, oh. don't do it. Okay. I'll just go and, and stick them on the back of cars. Is that better? <laughs> I'm sure every car <laughs> in Vancouver has a bumper sticker with, <laughs> gonna geek on it by now uh, well there you go that's gonna close up our feature segment on this but we want to know how exactly have you dealt with in-person podcast promotion scenarios let us know through any of the ways again betterpodcasting.com is the best way to let us know and one thing that we can all take away from this here is that if you ever ever see stargate pioneer in person number one Get really good at lifting business cards off of him, because if you make sure that he has none on him, then he will give you a dollar bill. It's a it's a quick get rich quick scam. That's what it is I, right there. I, I see. Well, you're assuming I have a dollar bill. I might ask for a dollar bill from the other person. <laughs> Absolutely. But let's go ahead and move on to the better podcasting download. Welcome to this week's better podcasting download. 
we have a ton of subjects. You know, some weeks we're like, man, where are we going to talk about the download? And then there's a week like this week and we're like, man, there's too much to cover, but we're going to cover it all. So we're going to gloss <laughs> over it at a high level really quick so we can get through everything. The first one we're going to talk about is Pandora. Now, I know Stephen has no idea what I'm talking about because Pandora is not available in Canada. Pa but Pandora? Pan yeah, Pandora is a streaming service like Spotify here in the United States, and it is now, as of yesterday, offering a limited amount, but still offering podcasts on their service, kind of like Spotify. So I'm, Steven, I'm not I'm not getting it, SP. I, I, I literally I have Pandora here. I, 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 I've got this bracelet. I'm talking into my bracelet. Play better podcasting podcast. It's, it's not it's not working, SP. I don't get it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, I have a ton of those Pandora boxes around my house, too, because I live with three women. Oh, gosh, that's so funny. Oh, thanks for breaking me, Steve. No worries. I'll, anytime I can. <laughs> All right. So Pandora, in this case, is not the at Pandora on Twitter. It is a music streaming service that is finally streaming audio. And the reason why a lot of people are really stoked about this in the United States is that if you take a look at the infinite dial which is done by edison research and triton earlier on this year pandora is clearly the most recognized brand and people say they have listened to pandora more than they have listened to spotify and since spotify has come across in podcasting stats somewhere between five and ten percent of the total people are like oh we're going to get another whatever percentage out of this now that pandora is starting to allow people onto their system. Now, I don't think it's going to be Nirvana. We're not going to be talking about hockey stick growth. It's only going to be in the places where Pandora is available, for example, not Canada. So you're not going to get a good worldwide bump, but you are going to get a bump in places like the United States of America where Pandora is available. Will it be a 1% bump? Will it be a 5% bump? Will it be a 15% bump? I can't answer those questions. They just started this yesterday. It's a trial run with 420 different podcasts, and it's just with certain number of people in the game of distributors that are in the game. Now, Libsyn is one, and they were able to choose some limited number of podcasts, but also publishers like APM, Gimlet, HeadGum, Maximum Fun, NPR, Podcast. PRX, Revolver, Slate, The New York Times, The Ramsey Network, Ringer, WNYC Studios, and Wondery. Those are the outlets that get to produce to Pandora right now. Now, if everything goes well and Pandora doesn't see any glitches, they said that they will start hand-selecting other shows to be included. If you happen to be hosting your show on Lipson, you can go ahead and email them support at Libsyn.com and ask for your show to be considered to be included. Now, we went through this once before with Spotify. And as I told before, it was what I can't remember. It was two and a half or three years from the time that my initial email went out to Libsyn to when Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Starling Tribune were actually included in Spotify. This could be a similar fate over in Pandora. Now, those are the basic blocks about what Pandora is doing. Steven, I know you have some insightful things to say here. You know, I, I gotta say, I question them doing this process when it they've got such a recent model in Spotify that Spotify went with this route originally and then expanded. And boy, did they expand very quickly. And it's very odd to me that Pandora wouldn't use that free knowledge and sort of go bigger from the beginning. Now, with that said, they are, though, right away saying that they plan to uh, open this up and there will be a podcast portal. I actually did listen to the released episode on the app. I downloaded the feed app uh, where Rob talked about it. Deleted now because I don't really have a use for it, but I listened. I downloaded the app so I could hear the release. And it's clear to me that it seems like Pandora is really giving limited information or there's limited information i can say that lives in and is talking about i don't know which it is so it's really interesting to see that one of the things that they did tell libsyn was there will be a podcaster portal i don't think that's the term they used 
but they did make sure that Rob knew that, which is awesome because number one, hopefully that will help alleviate the whole Spotify fiasco where everybody ended up um, double entry, not everybody, but a lot of people ended up adding their show twice to Spotify and causing problems because yeah, it just kind of came out of the blue. So now we can or, hopefully control that and get people who are on Libsyn to just stay in Libsyn so that they don't end up submitting their show multiple times. And Libsyn has said one of the benefits is you get to integrated stats within Libsyn itself. And if you're using Libsyn, you should be using, in my opinion, you should be using the Libsyn stats. So you'd want to integrate your stats into that platform and just submit via Libsyn. And you you're not going to get any more preferential treatment if you're in Lipson or outside of Lipson. I just don't see that happening. Yeah. So we actually know two podcasters that have gotten their shows onto Pandora through due to this trial. One is Emily Prokop with the story behind pro uh, podcast. Congratulations, Emily. We're looking forward to your experience there. And the other one happens to be the Cantina cast, which I know through my experience with the basement podcast and that's part of the ear glue media and they are also going to be on Pandora. So there is going to be a star Wars pan podcast mm -hmm. on Pandora if you're interested. Yeah. So it's great to see they've got, um, not just big names out there. And I think that that's a, a check in the check boxes there. And I think that that's a really good move for them to include some of those shows. But I, I just, again, I question why they're keeping it so contained to start, but We'll see what happens. They did say that they have a future plan. The other thing is, as a Canadian, uh, obviously, I, I'm joking aside, I know what Pandora is. Uh, that was the whole joke, because I don't know what it is, because I'm Canadian. Because Pandora is really only a U.S. streaming company. Um, I, at least as far as my quick research showed. I know that Pandora went and bought the assets from a Canadian streaming company called Ardio a while back. I think they're Canadian. But then they did nothing with it. So it's really weird to me, and I did some research globally, and so from a global perspective, this comes from um, Mydia, M-I-D-I-A, and I'll go ahead and throw the link in the doc at uh, betterpodcasting.com slash 156, and the long story short is that Pandora in the global streaming music subscription market in H1 of 2018 was 3%. The big people was Spotify with 36%, Apple Music with uh, 19% and Amazon mu streaming music with 12%. And then there were some other ones in there like Deezer and Google mentioned, but Pandora was sitting at around 3% with, I think was 6 million subscribers. So as opposed to, of course, Spotify's 83 million. But it's just really interesting to me to see this being such a big move in podcasting. I get it for Americans. I know Pandora has a pretty good foothold, it seems like, but from a global perspective, like in the chat, we've got a couple of people right now saying, yeah, no Pandora over here uh, in their parts of the world. So it's just interesting to see this being such a big thing when those of us who aren't in America, it's like, cool, I can't get it. And I understand that. And the jury is out on how this is actually going to pan out. So we'll just take it one month at a time and see where we're at about six months from now could be two years from now but we'll see <laughs> what happens i have faith that this will move a little bit faster than spotify moving on to the second item that we have to talk about this is actually a rehash of an item we spoke about before and that's the whole apple podcast spamming our compadre daniel j lewis over at audacity to podcast just came out with a new episode episode number 334 of the audacity to podcast of which he detailed his experience of getting booted out of Apple Podcasts slash iTunes. I'm just going to call it iTunes for now, but yes, I know it's Apple Podcasts for title and author tag spamming. Now, basically, I'm not going to give away everything in the blog article and the podcast that Daniel put out, but basically within there, he mentioned, Daniel mentioned that some of the top 200 podcasts had short descriptive modifiers in their titles. Now, because of that, and because I have lamented the fact of having to take those out of my two podcasts that I do, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Starling Tribune, I have now placed back short modifiers in my titles for those two shows. I did so very, very reluctantly, but I just wanted to see about the differential in SEO. So for Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., it is now Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. colon an unofficial Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. fan podcast. 
Now, for those of you that don't know, the title of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is actually Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So that is why I describe Marvel as part of that. Now, the, the Starling Tribune is changed to the Starling Tribune colon an unofficial Arrow TV show fan podcast. Now, you will note in both cases, I wanted to qualify that these were unofficial fan shows but also what the main subject matter was about. So I had to get those both in an unofficial fan podcast about arrow an unofficial fan podcast about agents of shield. I am very uneasy about doing this for a variety of reasons, but I wanted to definitely try this out as a test for better podcasting listeners. So you all know that I have done it. And if you are all looking at the results, we'll see if those shows are still in there a week from now, two weeks from now, two months from now, we're going to see at any point in time, these shows can be taken out. Now, Daniel, he describes some specific instances of which those shows that have gotten kicked out of what happened right before they got kicked out. I'll leave that to go over into his article if you are interested, but suffice it to say, it could happen to any show at any time. There is a definite trigger, though, that triggered his from getting kicked out. So if you're interested, go find his stuff and, and understand exactly what happened to him. I am still very, very uneasy, especially since those modifiers are so long, but I didn't know any other way to do it. I mean, I could have said uh, Arrow TV show or uh, Arrow podcast, uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. podcast. But I just I had to get that unofficial fan podcast qualifier in there because I didn't want to get sued by Marvel or DC or Warner Brothers or CW. Yeah. And I think it's important to remember what SP said, which was that Daniel recounts his experience. And we just don't know because there's no official guidelines on it right now by Apple. So we're hearing things from Daniel who actually had something removed. We've heard things from people like like Dave and Rob at Libsyn and then Todd over at Blueberry. And they're a little bit different than what Daniel's saying and what his experience, Daniel's firsthand experience was being removed and talking to Apple Podcasts. So at this point, it remains to be seen what's going to happen. And if one of SPs gets removed, he'll make sure to recount his firsthand experience over on this show here. I kind of want it to get reported just so we have more content. No, just joking. <laughs> I don't want it to happen. No, Please, Apple, no, don't do no, it. Don't, I, don't, no. I don't. I want these. And and Apple, if there's any way you can email me before automatically booting me, that would be great. But that's another thing that they don't do. They don't give you any no. warning whatsoever. Now, Daniel did say he was spamming both in the title and author tag, but he did say that uh, the modifiers only in the title tag were OK or it perceived to be OK. Do not spam the author tag. That will set off their counters right away. Do not do it. I did not change my author tags. It is simply the co-hosts that are on the show. All right. Well, moving on to point number three in the download, Blueberry's IAB stats compliance. For those of you who aren't familiar with the fact that IAB does not actually certify yet podcast statistic companies, there is a process in place to get that happening and blueberry has been trying and working towards trying to be the first at least that's what they claim so they are trying to get that actual certification from iab to be iab compliant and they have had to make some changes and they just put out a article and again we'll have that in the notes at betterpodcasting.com uh slash 156 and we're not going to read the whole thing out, but there were a few takeaways and it's that they need to make a few changes in order to get towards that certification. And number one, what they say is that enterprise company customers like ESPN and ABC will have no changes at all to there. The second change is going to be to people who are not the enterprise customers, but are media hosting with Blueberry. What they're going to say, what they say is how they process data will change to process data based off of raw log files. And this is going to allow them to provide some new unique information. And that's something that they'll give an update on that as more information comes out. And then non-hosting customers who are using Blueberry statistics, what they're saying is that they are having to do more audits and basically put code in place that's going to audit websites that are essentially hitting the Blueberry statistics to see if they are doing activities like 
preloading a file and making sure that that is not happening because if websites are doing that, they are not within IAB compliance. And this is something that I spoke about a while back was that this is a big flaw in the whole IAB process is you have to make sure that the players are not preloading and so many companies basically have to control the player itself. And so if someone is stepping outside of that player, it's really hard to make sure that, that preload is not happening. We, I think we saw that happen with, uh, was it PodTrack or, I, PodTrack or iHeartMedia or something like that a while back. We saw a whole blow up from that happening. And so this is something that it looks like Blueberry is going to be putting code in place that's going to audit these websites. So there are definitely some changes coming with Blueberry statistics. So like we've seen with many other hosting companies, as we work towards getting this universal certification of stats, you are going to see changes happen. We've seen it before, and I will guess that this means that likely you might see a potential drop with your Blueberry stats. That's my suspicion here. I'm happy to see them making these changes. I think that it's important that somebody gets certified darn quick because once they're certified, then that is something that they can hold over other competitors and those competitors will hopefully then work towards getting certification because until everybody's certified, there's still just a general uh, broad interpretation of IAB compliance and we're not exactly apples to apples. I'm not sure if the certification is going to be a one and done or if it's going to be a continual like annual audit or something like that, because I think auditing is going to be a continual part of being IAB compliant once you're actually certified to be compliant. The reason I want to say this is I noticed over at Pinecast, they have their own subreddit and they said that they are doing an annual audit right now and they are changing some of the statistics. They are retroactively changing and filtering out some of their statistics because of this issue. I've also heard that Libsyn, they found a, a, an a issue with the iOS stats, like the Apple Watches, the Apple Watch 4s, they just downloaded a bunch of podcasts to fill up your their watch. And they knew that because of that device and because it was a known issue, they are filtering out those, or I think they will filter them out from now on, but I don't know if they're gonna retroactively. So this audit, part of the IAB compliance is continually going. So I don't know, even if Blueberry is certified as compliant, if it will be compliant for a year, two years, whatever, before these people have to go back in. Now, as for other people going through the process, I was kind of curious about this. And Elsie Escobar, who's the social happy media person over at Libsyn, she serves as their PR arm for the company, she tweeted from her personal account. So this was not from the Lipsons account. She said, stop looking at your stats, podcasters, stop it. There are so many other things for you to be doing. So many. Instant gratification and audience growth is not like getting a thumbs up and a heart on social media. You are wasting your time. One day for stats, 29 days out of 30 for content plus community building. So that's actually good advice. So I'm have no problem reading that. But I replied to her because she brought up stats. I was like, hey, are, did you know, are the Limpsid stats going to be certified by the IAB to be compliant to 2.0 standards soon, knowing that Blueberry has gone through that process? Now, she said it was a, and this is in all caps, long, grueling, uncapitalized, process for Blueberry. And I believe they are the only ones that have been involved in the process now. Don't think AIB, I think she meant IAB, it's set up to do everything at once, so one service at a time and not soon. It's not like passing the bar exam one at a time. And I said, well, good luck, and I hope you studied well, going with the bar exam uh, theme there. Please keep us informed, as I'm sure there will be eventually be high interest in the results if there isn't already. And she said, yeah, I don't think it's like a test, as in you pass and you don't, and you get a grade. It's if you don't pass, you have to go then fix it, then do the whole thing again, and then again, and then again, and then again. The result is either you are certified or you are not. So that is some clarification from Elsie Escobar, who is the social media happiness person at Libsyn. One thing before we do get off of this whole stats discussion is, I don't know if you remember the part that I had mentioned that Blueberry was not making a change for corporate customers or enterprise customers. I had actually asked them on their Facebook page why that change didn't need to happen. 
And Mike Dell had responded and he had said that they're already using log file statistics versus redirects. So why I wanted to mention that was because I think that's another layer that we don't know about. Um, there must be something in there with the whole redirect process that makes it more difficult to get that certification. So who knows whatever that little speed bump is with the redirect process. Maybe that plays into, you know, whatever that is, maybe that plays into why this is not happening for more companies. I don't know. It's, it's interesting to see that Blueberry is trying to be first. And again, I think that it w is good if somebody does become first. So if you have seen any statistics drops in recently, know that it might be because people are trying to conform to the standard. You don't know. You really don't know. But uh, looks like we're headed towards getting that certification with somebody. But let's go ahead and move on to the better pod back. Here we go. Josh Liston from On The Bubble Podcast and also from Australia. Hey, how you doing, Josh? He tweeted us and he said, Leo, five minute audible ad. Who? <laughs> Getting back to Leo Laporte, we talked about Mount Rushmore of podcasters last episode. That seems to be a running joke with a lot of professional podcasters. They start out the show, they run four or five, sometimes 10 minutes worth of ads, and then they start the show. I was thinking about this, Stephen. Honestly, if I am in their position and I have made podcasting my job and I have to sustain myself and my family with it, having the ads at the start, unfortunately, is the best placement. I mean, how many YouTube videos have you watched and then you ultimately skip through them if you can, but you watch them and then you watch a video versus how many ads do you watch after the video is done? I mean, just plus stop and just move on to the next video after the video. I mean, if I want to support them, like if it's one of the sailing channels that I watch, yes, I'll listen to the ad afterwards. But if I'm listening to Leo Laporte show, which I don't, by the way, I don't do it regularly. I have in the past, like one or two episodes, but I've never regularly listened to Leo Laporte show. Then yeah, I'm, I'm just skipping that and I'm moving on to the next one. So I can see if it's at the beginning. I have heard that we are training, quote unquote, training our listeners to do the skip button through those four, five, six minute ads at the beginning. So I'm not sure how effective they're going to be. But yeah, Leo Laporte puts a lot of ads at the beginning of his show. <laughs> By the way, over on Discord, uh, we did have a response about the Mount Rushmore podcasting. And Zachary Webb had said George Washington would be Adam Curry, invented podcasting. Thomas Jefferson would be Leo Laporte, making tech podcasts popular. Abraham Lincoln would be Daniel J. Lewis, influential in podcasting slash history. And Theodore Roosevelt would be Dave Jackson, podcaster about podcasting since 2005. And there are more that I would add if we had a larger mountain. So there you go. Um, so that's Zachary Webb's choices. And if you want to give us your choices, please let us know through any of the ways. We'll go ahead and follow up in a future episode of this show. I know this whole start thing started on Reddit. We'd be happy to talk about it here a little bit. Back over on Twitter at the covert underscore nerd got back to us and he said, in my opinion, the podcast hall of fame is like the Academy Awards. The winners don't always reflect what the consumers like. For example, the color purple and the Shawshank Redemption, among many others, never won an Oscar. Maybe it will be different in the future for podcasting. Good points. That's very good points. And I think that, um, and I had mentioned this on Twitter, I think that's why you might want to see a body like the Emmys, right? You know, you got the Academy Awards and, and the Emmys. I think the Emmys are the ones by the foreign press, aren't they? Or mm, I might be mixing them up. But the they're voted by a very different pool of people. So that's why they kind of cover different things. Uh, so I think that it would be really good if we had an alternative that maybe did end up covering a little bit more of consumer facing. We'll call it that. I don't know if that's a valid term for it, but that's what I would I would like to see. Because I think, again, as I mentioned last week, there's a lot of really deserving names on that list but i think there are some d names missing as well we also got a comment on guineageek.com from johnny pennington and it was in response to his posted zoom l12 tutorial after a year of using he has put another tutorial on the guinea geek gear youtube channel johnny said steven i enjoyed your zoom l12 tutorial i watched your first one last year and also enjoyed it 
Although I do not intend on buying the L12, podcasting and recording gear is always fun to learn more about. Now for the big question. When are you planning to shell out the $1,000 US, uh, I'll qualify that because it's got to be like $15,000 Canadian, to buy the Zoom L20 just so I can enjoy another one of your reviews. Thanks for another better podcasting slash gonna geek gear review, Johnny Pennington. Johnny, 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 what can I say? I'm cheap. I'm very cheap. But I will say this. I will leave this tease just hanging out there. Keep your eyes on youtube.com slash gonna geek gear. youtube.com slash gonna geek gear. Definitely keep your eyes on that because there might be some satisfying for you over there in regards to your message. And we'll leave it at that. We'll just leave that, that, that there. Tease. Steven's gonna use it like he stole it. <laughs> but there you go. If you got feedback about your show, please get in touch with us so that we can make sure to add it to a future edition of Better Pod back. Go ahead, tweet us at Better Pod or email us podcast at betterpodcasting.com. So there you go for episode number 156 of Better Podcasting. I'm Stephen John Drew saying thanks for checking out the show. And again, I'm looking at Pandora right now, trying to activate some podcasts. This bracelet just isn't doing anything. I'm SP saying thanks, Chris, for the shirt. Chris Nessie, House of EdTech. End the show, Pandora. See you next week. Thank you for listening to another episode of Better Podcasting. We want to hear from you. You can find all of our contact information at betterpodcasting.com. If you like the show, please consider giving us a five-star review in iTunes. We encourage you to check out all of the other geeky podcasts available at gunnageeknetwork.com. This has been a Gunna Geek production. Thanks for listening, and we will see you again next week. <laughs>